and welcome to Discovery, Knight Foundation's weekly program on the arts. I'm Priya Sarkar, Director of Arts at the Foundation, and today we'll be discussing community engagement in service of a more equitable future. Thank you for joining us. Our guest today is Joy Bailey Bryant, Vice President and Managing Director at the cultural planning firm, Lord Cultural Resources. Born in Atlanta and based in New York, Joy has worked all over the world with civic leaders, arts and cultural organizations, artists, architects, designers, planners, and residents to bring people and culture together. Joy has worked in cities where Knight Foundation funds as well, including Detroit and most recently Macon, Georgia, where she led development of the recently completed Macon Cultural Plan. She's a national expert on community engagement and the person who taught me about meeting people where they are. Joy, so wonderful to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Joy, I think you're Thank on you. mute. <laughs> I, got I got it every time. Thank you so much for joining me, Priya, and for having me on. I'm, I'm excited about our conversation and, and hope we can keep it to the, to the amount of time. 30 minutes doesn't seem like enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. It's it's a big talk, topic, and we, you and I can always uh, talk for hours, so um, we'll do our best. Um, I just want to let viewers know that we will have a brief Q&A at the end, and you can submit your questions anytime during this conversation in Zoom, in the chat, uh, or in the Q&A function, or in the comments if you're watching on Facebook Live. And uh, our, our, my colleagues at Knight Foundation will share those questions with me and we'll do our best to work some in toward the end. So Joy, uh, community engagement has been a hot topic and especially hot topic, I should say, for many of us recently, not only in arts and culture. Um, so let's get right to it. What does it mean to meet people where they are? Well, you know, Priya, I, it's great to start with that as the, as, the, um, as the beginning. And meeting people where they are is a physical idea as well as a mental idea. Um, physically, meeting people where they are uh, means, you know, everybody doesn't have time to pitch up at, for two hours on a Wednesday evening to talk about their needs pertaining to culture or pertaining to um, you know, the, their parks or pertaining to the library, but it doesn't mean they don't care about those things. It really means they just don't have the time. Instead, they're getting ready, getting dinner ready. They are getting homework done. They're doing all of these different things. So how can we as planners, um, as people who, who say that we want to engage with the public, really meet those people who want to, in their hearts, um, engage with us? How can we meet them physically and mentally in those spaces. So physically, we can go to where they are going. Um, if you want to speak to people who have, uh, you know, who, who have children, or if you want to speak to people who have a particular need, go to that agency that they use. Uh, go to the Board of Education meeting. Go to the PTA. Go to um, the, the uh, various and sundry, the library meetings that are happening. Um, the genealogical society, all of those different things that are people and organizations that are already meeting, put yourself on that agenda. That's a physical. In the mental space, um, when, you're, when you're really thinking about what engaging with people on a, on, a, on a mental level, just ensuring that you are getting to them, that you are making it clear to them that they are the most important people in this conversation, not you. Um, we had community engagement has this kind of um, the start with this uh, governmental model. I know this is the longest answer to your one question, but it has, a, <laughs> it has a, a governmental model start. If you, if you can think about like the Park Service always had to have a public meeting to pass the plans that were already um, put into place or already had been put together. So essentially you were, you were meeting at one, uh, one evening to rubber stamp these plans and, and, and saying, okay, this is what's going to happen. Really meeting people in a space where you're starting the conversation with them. So it's not at the end of the, of the process, it's at the beginning, um, it's during, and it's, it, it, is, it is at the end. And then it goes on and on and on and on. So meeting people where they are 
is, is really um, something that you have to think about and work to achieve. That's, that's great. That's helpful to think about, Joy. So, I, you know, I want to touch on one thing that you mentioned, how it came, it's maybe the, the history of sort of community engagement practice came from this model of rubber stamping. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that. I know a lot of different um, terms are often used in conversation about community engagement. Um, Buy-in is one, yeah. investment is another. Uh, can you talk a bit about maybe what what you see as best practice or or just the best philosophy yes yes well real real community engagement you know priya you and i talk about this and and um really worked at this for years but real community engagement starts a conversation right it doesn't the 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 um and and that conversation honestly sometimes is the deliverable right so um and that's an important Important piece to understand because um, as opposed to that model that I that I cited where you were trying to get a rubber stamp on a plan that was and, and now we are ending the process um, if we're talking about real and community engagement we're allowing um, people to to start this conversation that's going to allow them to have kind of a spectrum um, of, of, of entry I think um, the first is kind of a basic piece right um, and this is uh, best practices in your thinking of how to engage a, a process, a, a community engagement process. The, the best, the start um, is a basic need that people have to have to be heard. Um, you know, and when we talk about a lot of these fraught topics, I started um, really working with projects in, uh, for instance, the Albany Civil Rights Institute in Albany, Georgia. That is in Southwest Georgia. And um, when I started to work with that group um, in, the, in the early and late, early 2000s, um, at that point in time, many of those, those people had um, never been able to tell the stories and experiences that they had had in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, uh, you know, leading up to the civil rights era, in the midst of the civil rights era. And these were elders and people who just wanted to be heard and they just wanted to get their point out and as long as they were able to be heard that was actually enough mm -hmm. and um that is that's one thing because they had yes they had stories to tell and we wanted to capture those but there was also a significant amount of anger that they themselves needed to let go of and as a part of that being heard was was truly important so the first point i would say is allowing people to be heard we, you know, we have a need to control the conversation. Sometimes it's okay if you just allow people to be heard. You know, you hold that microphone, but you let people get it out. That's the first, that's the first thing. Be comfortable with that. Be comfort in that discomfort. The second group of people is the kind that most of us are comfortable with. Those are the people who are coming to hear the conversation. They're coming to share a little bit. They're coming to be informed. You know, they're the people who are, um, you know, as I said, we're the, we're, they're the ones that we're most comfortable with because they're, gonna, they're going to participate a little bit, but they're not the people who are, you know, just like steeped in the whole situation, right? Um, so those are the middle ground people. Um, and the, the third, the most involved, I would definitely say, are the people that you're looking and, and organizations and groups that you're really looking to form that shared vision with. And that's where you want to get to that space of, um, and, and they are looking for a shared vision. And you're going to be going, coming back and forth and really moving forward in, in an um, engaged, ongoing conversation that begins, continues, does not have an end and continues beyond, um, you know, whatever it is that you 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 want to see um, happen. So, in in the best practices, I think it's really understanding that spectrum, respecting that spectrum, and appreciating that spectrum. Um, and I, I would even, if I could go into, there's some logistical, easy kind of logistical things that we please do. do. <laughs> yeah. This is this is so, news so, you can yeah. use for the folks at home. So please go. Yes, yes, Going tools you can use. So one of the things that we, uh, we talk about is inclusive engagement and people are 
What's inclusive? How do I know? How do I define? Well, you know, the census helps us, right? So <laughs> they give us they give us this American Community Survey. Um, they give us, uh, you know, your economic development department of the cities and counties that you live in. They give you the demographics of your of your space. Um, you can go into depth about, you know, who and how many, what ages, and when you're designing your process, use that information and gather that information at all of your conversations allow people to fill out to their comfort level a demographic survey so that you can understand who you are engaging and once you have that information hold yourself up to it look at your census numbers and exceed that right so if you're looking at populations that are majority minority populations you want to make sure that your uh, conversations, your surveys, whatever those are, that you're actually engaging with um, groups that look like the communities that you're, you're trying to serve. And if it doesn't look like that, and I'm going to tell you in your first conversations, Priya, you know this, you know, it's, it's not. It's just not because the people who have the time to initially engage do not do not um, normally, you know, look like the, the exactly like the populations of, of some of our cities. So that's when you start to design even further into your process. You're looking at who, where do I need to go to gain those audiences, uh, you know, of different accessibilities, of different ethnicities, um, different ages, uh, and wh whatever that demographic is, going after them with the pursuit and, and determination that makes um, that where you are really engaging with the broad spectrum of your community. So that's one of the kind of like ways to really get into it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. And and I want to just follow up. Well, there's a lot in there that I'd like to follow up on. Um, one of them is, you know, you talked a bit about sort of different categories or sort of profiles of folks in the community who um, might, you know, participate in an engagement process, um, uh, especially if, if, you know, reached out to. And I guess I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how, to, how to design uh, a way to um, to sort of have space and opportunities for all those different folk types of people and their sort of personalities and proclivities to to feel like they can be part of a process. You know, I'm, I'm thinking a bit about um, earlier earlier uh, this week on our sister program uh, from Knight Foundation, Coast to Coast. Uh, my colleagues hosted um, architect Walter Hood and public space fellow, uh, Knight Public Spaces fellow. And he talked about how he's not necessarily looking for um, you know common common ideas but he's looking for different perspectives to be able to exist in in, in, a, in a space I guess you know and I think about the work that you do and so much of that is planning um, toward a shared vision but how how do you think about um, how to make people feel welcome or like they can participate and then you know um, that various viewpoints can still exist in some kind of shared vision or plan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's really, I think really Priya, that's getting back to that idea of ensuring that people know that they are heard. That's that, that first piece of, um, you know, hearing people, uh, no matter what, you know, it, 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 in the conversation, there's always that space where, um, someone just kind of says things and you're like, okay, that's interesting. And, and, you're, and you're thinking, okay, where does that go? But if you allow for that voice to be heard, what's great in my opinion about conversations is that, you know, we always have this, we actually have this activity, one activity that we do, um, which is called and, uh, and it's both and, right? So um, it's okay and, okay and, and it allows for people um, to, you know, whatever they say, it's, it's just kind of building upon and building upon and building upon. So this, this idea that um, what, you're, what you're putting into the atmosphere has importance and, and, it, and it, starts to, it starts to help people to see other points of view. It starts to 
instead of just kind of shutting down ideas all, all together um, and understanding that we're not all trying to, um, you know, hold hands and, and sing Kumbaya, but we are building a, a container that allows for this, this broader um, perspective, perspective, you know, a broader spectrum of, of understanding. And this is where that idea that I said earlier of the conversation is the deliverable, where it really does start to, to, to make some sense. Because that is, you know, I, I remember early on, the first time the, the, the uh, White House had an office of public engagement was in, in, in 2008. And that was huge. That was a, that was a huge thing to actually have an, an, a, an official federal office of public engagement. And it was their deliverable was a conversation. It was not around the plan. It was around, you know, a continual series of conversations to get us all to ensure that we are all heard. And then, you know, and in, in, in create that container for the shared vision. So that uh, strikes me as especially relevant in terms of the current context. What's happening this spring and summer in terms of we're in a pandemic. Um, it's, it's affecting the entire country and much of the world. Um, but it's also being felt differently in different communities. Yeah. Uh, the impacts of it and how different people are experiencing it is different based on what community you're living in and also personally. Um, and then meanwhile, we have an intensification this summer of the racial justice movement yeah. uh, and, and uh, conversations about equity. Um, I guess, you know, in thinking about these as two, um, at least two, major national conversations that are taking place on a local level. It, that's where a lot of these conversations are play, playing out locally. Um, how, how, do you, how do you think about, um, you know, how do you think about having a national conversation locally um, and, and the role of community engagement in that? And, and I think too, something you mentioned about sitting being comfortable with discomfort, it seems like something that so many of us are um, increasingly needing to do. Um, right. and, and you've worked in a lot of communities and a lot of projects on sensitive topics specifically, um, uh, difficult yeah. topics, um, um, sites that have very complicated histories. Anything you can share in your experience that we might keep in mind as we go through these conversations? Yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about this so much that COVID and, well, COVID to start, really just um, brought to light issues that were already present. Then the, the social uprisings across the country um, really um, just honed in on the fact that we had not acknowledged so many of the issues that were present right in front of our face, right? We hadn't had um, the Truth and Reconciliation um, commissions that so many, you know, that, that Canada, ha Canada has had, um, that South Africa has had. Yeah, it, at least the start, the acknowledgement of, um, you know, that, that these things actually happen and having conversations about those um, on a really national level, right? And then breaking that down and bringing that into the local spaces and homes. And instead it has been left to organizations like, uh, you know, the, the, the smaller, um, you know, African-American museums, for instance, um, or um, different cultural types, the types of spaces. You know, in Macon, we started that plan a year ago. It, it actually com was completed and, and we're launching it, but it was completed in January. We had the priorities in January. And equity is the wrapping, we have what's called a power pyramid um, of, of five priorities for the city. And equity is the priority that wraps around the entire uh, plan. And that was, that was in January before COVID, um, certainly before the social uprising started, but it was not before everything um, that had, has, you know, was causing it happen. Um, so the Making Cultural Plan, for instance, because of um, COVID 
And because of the social uprising, it, it really, that process it built a muscle for that arts and cultural community to respond to COVID. That because of the cultural plan, they, and now I'm going a far afield, but I'm gonna tell you this because it's important. Um, because of the cultural plan, they actually had an arts and cultural, a list of the arts and cultural um, organizations, the individual artists, um, the, the, um, the programs and work that was being done across the city. All of that, which was not present before they had gone through the process, now they had that. They also had a plan that said, how can we respond to these inequitable issues that we see across our city? And now that everything is jumping off with COVID and with the uprisings and with everything that's happening, what are we going to do? They had a, they had a plan, they had like, you know, priorities, ta uh, strategies, tasks, they had it already identified. And that, that was because they, they really um, recognized early and, and had planned for that. So, so I, I went far afield to tell you about um, the ways that the ways that 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 the real uh, COVID and the uprisings just were exacerbating things that had that had already that were already present, um, and then just coming back around to this to this idea of acknowledging um, those issues because it, within that plan there was that acknowledgement and therefore we had something to do. We knew how to respond. If you don't talk about it, there's no way you can build a response. Right. It's impossible. And there's something else um, too that I'm hearing in what you're saying, which is, which is that laying of the groundwork in terms of the work that had happened in that planning process. And I think it actually what you said, Joy, relates really well to one of the questions. It's probably a great time to kind of start bringing in some of the questions from viewers. Um, um, so one is from Jose. Um, what's the responsibility of planning and civic departments to do that work, the deep dive digging? I mean, I think, I, th I think it is your, <laughs> I think that planners, in my experience of planners, uh, you know, we're members of APA and really enjoy um, that work. I think it's, it is implicit in what you do. Um, as, as planners, we are able to um, really see that, that demographic research. We're able to see the effects and understand, understand what's happening in our cities. But we need to be looking at the root causes of that and who tells us what those root causes are other than the people who are experiencing this. How do you identify the people who are experiencing this? You need to do the, the deep dive digging into those communities. So identifying who they are and then going to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's really helpful. And I and I think a follow up question is one um, is about given, especially right now. You know, you talked about meeting people where they are physically and mentally, and physically is kind of challenged in some ways during pandemic related uh, uh, gathering restrictions. Do you have any suggestions for ways that folks can do this? Um, when, you know, when we have these kind of limitations right now? So I will, I will be really transparent in that the first, the first part of my answer is going to be somewhere that I feel we've had an amazing amount of success in the last four months. The second part of my answer is still a question for me. The first part is right here in this forum, because we are all now in this space where we have access to everyone. We have access to a, you know, a, a world of people um, who go to their community board meetings on, on this, you know, in this format, whatever the format is. Uh, it could be big blue button, Zoom, go to meeting, who, who cares, Microsoft Teams. Whatever it is, we can go to those meetings. So we can contact people, we can get to them. And I will say one of the things that um, we were told the other day, I did a community board meeting the other day and um, one person said, well, it was kind of nice to talk to something other than reopening. Um, so that was it, it was a it was a nice conversation. So that has been heartening in that we can still do that people are still 
and, and people even more are yearning to connect with one another. And so as a result, they are more likely to get onto these um, formats. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are having more access to people who are older, people who might not have um, come out of their homes um, before, um, because we are doing this in our homes or in this, in this format, we do have access to differently able people, for instance. It's providing a lot more access to people who, um, be in, in, an, in a physical sense, we might not have been able to engage with as well. The second part of my answer is the digital divide. The digital divide is real. Um, and, you know, there's only so much that you can do with, with a phone um, or, or without Wi-Fi enabling. And a lot of people um, got their Wi-Fi from libraries and libraries are closed, you know, and um, a lot of places are not in, in more rural areas do not have uh, the bandwidth, for instance, to do a conversation like this. So that is challenging and that is something that we are still trying to address um, in these last few months, the ways that we can get to different people. We have had really courageous and wonderful people who we've been, you know, working with clients of ours who are doing surveys and, you know, door to door and partnering with Meals on Wheels and those types of organizations that are still going out. Um, who can you know, get to people and, and they're, they're willing to do that effort and that work. So that's, that's one way. Um, it's definitely not a total solution, but we are working to figure that part out. Thank you. Um, another question comes from Charles. Um, this is about how to balance uh, potential, sometimes attention, uh, between community vision and community desires and, say, the artist's vision. Um, and, you know, that, I, of course, uh, I just want to acknowledge, too, that community engagement isn't just about planning processes, but certainly about design processes and that there are so many artists doing great uh, community engaged art um, and 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 they have their own best practices on how they do that but from your experience joy how do you see the way to um, balance that tension if it exists so um artists you know artist visions are artist vision is is amazing and it's essentially why you engage with artists um, in any point in time for any any type of especially public art piece whether it's um, you know, a visual arts piece or performance, um, it's, it's always the artistic vision is that thing that you are, you are investing in your, yourself, your, your time, your money, all those different things. And in a community engaged artists, that's actually part of the charm. That's the give and take, the push and pull. Um, that, that work that the community engaged artist is, is, is doing to be truly responsive to the community that they're working with. And, it, and going back to, I, I hope that if, if there's anything you take away from this, that real communi community engagement is, is, is the, the conversation is the, the deliverable. So that's the case even with the artistic vision, right? That it is an ongoing conversation with the artist and with the community. And you'll find with so many pieces, um, you know, the Astor Gates um, does pieces that where there's still like responses, a, you, the, the community is still able to build responses throughout the process. Um, there are so many artists who in their practice, they're building in those opportunities for artists or for the community to continue to um, change the work um, as, as it grows, as time goes by, so that it's not this stagnant piece. Instead, it, it has the, almost like the, uh, we always, you know, the, the Antiques Roadshow patina piece, you know, it, it grows over time. So the community is part of that response. That's great. And that reminds me of something that um, you said uh, um, when we were chatting, uh, you know, preliminarily, which was the idea of ownership and kind of that, you know, you, you talked at the beginning of the of the show about that engagement goes on and on and on and on. And, uh, and, and I wonder if you could just briefly talk a bit about that idea of ownership. Yeah, um, this is the, the, the idea is um, that it, it's yet again that kind of shared ownership, the community, the community and, and the artist, um, the, uh, 
the planner and the and the community that um, this is not a piece that um, I have finished and I'm walking away. Um, that this is a piece that it's. I'll, I'll tell you this: um, when we talk about community engagement, it's it's a way to under. It's a way to begin your social impact. Right, you're thinking about your social. Identify what you will do, what you want to do, what you need to do um, to to get to some kind of impact. It's the way that you'll do it. Community engagement is, and then it's the way that you will assess the impact of that. Right. So in that in that space of um, of, of getting to ownership, because you're because you're looking at and, and driving towards social impact, um, and it, it it is. That, that's, I think that's how you get to it, if I'm mm -hmm. being clear there. Yeah, and I, I, I think so. And I feel like what I'm taking from that, too, is that through, because time goes on and it's a long-term commitment and not yes. an acute sort of engagement, um, that ownership that's fostered leads to stewardship. Uh, and I think this comes up not only in a planning process that you're then needing to implement you right the plan is the beginning of what yeah. you're going to do as a community um but it's true for public space it's true for you know all kinds of things so yeah. um, and if you continue the conversation you'll always have ownership mm -hmm. like you'll always have you know instead of just getting buy-in for this one moment if you're going to continue that com we're always going to have an i am as a community member am always going to feel ownership over this over this because i'm continuing you know, there's, I'm a part of a continuous conversation. Yeah. It's, it's always, it's like, it's always mine, <laughs> you know, which is great. Yes. Which is important because then you have new people coming exactly, in. Exactly. Coming in and, yeah, and so. regenerating and you don't, you're not old. You're not, it's, it's not a, oh my God, I got to get rid of that. I got to change the name of that. I got to, it's, it's always um, growing and changing because the, the community is a part of that. Joy, as usual, uh, this has not been enough time. We're, we're pretty much out of time. I, I want to ask you, and, and I want to thank folks for sending in their great questions, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the wonderful questions. Um, I want to ask you before we completely wrap up, um, what, what do you see as being the opportunity in this moment? What are, what are you inspired by or hopeful about for? I, I am so inspired by the simple fact that we have to emerge from COVID, from these social uprisings as a changed world, a changed, no matter what city you live in, your local space has got to be different than it was before because it's, it's, all, it's all broken. Uh, you know, it's all broken down now and we have to build up anew. And we have an opportunity and a model to build up that, um, it, no, not a model. We have a, an opportunity to build and create a new model and that is, and create that shared vision together. Um, by this, you know, when, you, when there's a breaking down, there always has to be a building up. So the opportunity in this moment is for us to emerge as a right society, right? So, so we know what the problems were. Let's correct the problems and let's be better. Let's not rebu rebuild, let's build anew and, and be just totally, um, obviously through conversation, just really build that space that's inclusive for all and um, build, the, build those systems that are inclusive for all and, and a framework that works across all of our perspectives um, that's diverse, equitable, inclusive, accessible, all of the words that we need to include, let's, let's make that happen. That's the great opportunity here. Thanks, Joy, for that call to action. Um, I'm, it reminds me of a fabulous quote I just heard yesterday that I know we were talking about. Um, if my colleagues would, would share that, please. I want to thank uh, Donna Walker Kuhn, um, for um, whom I saw give a fabulous presentation yesterday, along with my friend Gary Padmore, as part of Lincoln Center Activates. And Donna shared this recent quote from uh, Indian writer Arundhati Roy, um, which I hope I'm not going to read to you. I hope you all can, can see the quote there. I just 
I loved this quote from Roy in a writing she published early during the pandemic that um, Donna shared as an exhortation to be pioneers for a better world. So Joy, thank you so much, so very much for sharing your insights, uh, for, for giving us tools uh, that we can use to do just that. Um, you can learn more about Joy and her work at Lord Cultural Resources at www.lord.ca. And on the topic of public spaces and inclusiveness, I uh, want to mention that Joy will be co-hosting a conversation with the Garden Conservancy next Thursday, July 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern on the topic of Gardens for a Changing World, Inclusive Gardens in Unconventional Spaces. And we'll put the link in the chat uh, where you can, and on Facebook, uh, where you can register for that talk. Um, and you can also find more information on future uh, discovery episodes on our website. Um, please join us again in two weeks on Friday, August 7th, when my colleague Chris Barr will be joined by Paul Farber and Karen Olivier to discuss reimagining monuments through stories of social justice and equity. Uh, Joy, thank you again. It's been such a pleasure. As I always say, you weren't named Joy for nothing. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't wait for our next conversation. Thank you, Priya. <laughs> and um, I want to want to also acknowledge. So my colleague Chris Barr uh, composed our intro music. Our exit music is by Akron jazz artist Theron Brown. Until next time, we wish you all good health, safety, and joy in art. Thank you and take care. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.